Shall rise up to pray. A great God in heaven, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people who are gathered together. We thank you, Lord, because you've come here to bless us. And we're praying that our families will be blessed in Jesus' name. As we look at the pages of scripture and turn from chapter to chapter and verse to verse, Lord, we pray that what we need will come through to every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that families who are suffering because of their own personal mistakes or personal sins, Lord, we pray your forgiveness and mercy and miracle will come upon every family like that in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you show us the way up and the way forward so that, Lord, our families will be blessed enriched by your grace power and love in jesus name amen. we pray lord that tonight you teach us things we do not know amen. and the things we knew before which we have forgotten we pray that you remind us in jesus name amen. bless our study together tonight amen. in jesus name we pray Tonight, we come back to the study of the Word of God again. And we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation. That means by the character. That means by the lifestyle. By the conduct of the wives. While they behold, while they see from day to day, your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, coupled with respect and honor, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plating the air, of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the healing man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. For after this manner, in all time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter she are, as long as she do well, and are not afraid with any amazement, likewise your husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. In the passage we read together, you'll see very clearly the Lord is talking to the family. And he's talking to the wives, as well as the husbands. Number verse 1, likewise ye wives. Verse 7, likewise ye husbands. And in between those two verses, you have the word of the Lord, the instruction of the Lord for both the wife and the husband, and then for the family together. It shows very clearly that we must be committed to building the family. If we're going to have a godly family, if we're going to have a happy family, both must be committed to the building of that family. We're told in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 1. Every wise woman buildeth a house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. That means then, the building the home or building the family is not just the work of God. Yes, it gives us the grace. 
He gives us the word. He gives us the instruction. He gives us the strength. He gives us the resources wherewith we can build a family. But we still have to be committed to building that family. Actually, when you think about building a home, it's like building a house. If you're going to build a good house, just like if you're going to build a godly family, a godly home, you need preparation. First of all, you need thought, plan, vision. What does that mean? You want to build a house. Here is an empty parcel of land. There is nothing there at all. But you see the whole house before you begin to build. That's what we're called thinking ahead, planning ahead. You come to this new parcel of land with nothing there at all. And you say, this will be the territory of the building. And all this surrounding will be the yard. Then you appoint you say, that is the doorway. Those are the windows there. And then you walk around, you say, here we're going to have the kitchen. And here we have to have, we're going to have the master bedroom. You go around and then you tell the architect who is going to draw the plan. You say, this is the kind of vision I have before you get married. That's why you need to think ahead and plan ahead. And say, this is the kind of home. And this is the kind of family. And this is the kind of people you want in the family. Here is how the father is going to be. You think ahead, you plan ahead. Here is how the mother is going to be and our children. Here are the kinds of children we're going to have. And then as you draw that plan, as you look, of course you look at the master plan, which is the word of God. Now if you're going to build a house, after you have thought about it, after you have sketched it down, then you call the builders. You're not building yet, you're preparing. You bring all the blocks and all the cement, everything together. And then you begin to build block upon block and you lay everything online. And while you're building, you keep on checking up. Is it following the sketch, the master plan that we drew down? Is this what we wanted? The same thing with marriage. If you're going to have a happy family first, there must be a design. There must be a purpose. And then you want to find out what are the resources you are going to have. You know how many people go into the marriage without ever thinking of the future implication of that marriage. They are not thinking about how the home is going to be. How the family is going to be. And they just go from day to day to day. It's just like if somebody wanted to build a house. And it's not thinking at all how the whole structure will be. And it just puts the blocks here and there. You're not going to have anything in resemblance to a home, to a house. The same thing in the family. If you just live from day to day without any goal, without any vision, without any dream, without any final structure... How the family is going to be. You'll not be able to put the family together. In Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 28. Luke chapter 14. Verse 28. For which of you intended to build a tower? So think about that. Which of you intended to build a house? Which of you intended to build a business? Which of you intending to build a life? Even your personal life. If you live from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year, and you never think in five years' time, this is who I want to be. This is where in my profession I want to be. This is how I want to live. This is what I want to have. In 10 years' time, this is who, where, what, uh, how I want to be. If you're not thinking of that, and you just live from day to day, from year to year, you'll be surprised. In 10 years' time, you'll just be like you are today. It is a plan. It's a thinking. It's a looking ahead that makes the life of a man. Which of you then, intending to build a life? Which of you then intended to build a family? Which of you intended to build a home? Seated not down first. 
If you don't sit down first and think ahead and look ahead and plan ahead, you will not be able to have a good home. Sit down first, count the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Hey, can you think of reasons why people begin to build and they're not able to finish? Their resources run out. Their zeal, their vision, their enthusiasm runs out. And the energy to want to build, the interest runs out. Have you found families that begin and they begin and you can always tell if the family is built on the foundation of emotion, enthusiasm. And then the, the fleshly kind of pleasure you are going to have, a time is coming when the zeal, the fire will die out. And then the emotion will not be there anymore. Build on a sure foundation and think ahead. You're going to build a home. You're going to build a family. What are the resources you need? And then as you think ahead, then you go to renew those resources day after day. That's how you're going to finish eventually and then you'll not be mocked by people. Like they mocked this fellow, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Well then, that means if you're going to build a, a godly home, you must then see that it's no less demanding as building a good building, a good house. Without consulting the divine architect, our homes will fall short of the desired glory and beauty. Before choosing a life partner, that is before choosing the husband to be, the wife to be, you must patiently wait for the architect's design before starting to build. Many houses do not follow the design or the specifications. And there you find those houses collapse. Don't you read in your newspapers, they say the house in that place has collapsed. And uh, when they tell us that, we don't see how many homes collapse. How many families collapse. And then you begin to find out these houses that, that are collapsing, killing many people. And then you find these lives that are buried under the rubbles of the collapsed building. Why do those buildings collapse when other buildings are standing? And sometimes it's because of the foundation. The foundation is not strong enough. Sometimes it's because of the substandard materials that are used in building those houses. Sometimes it's because the people do not follow the plan. And because they do not follow the plan, they're just in a hurry to build up the house. We want tenants, I want people there. And they endanger the lives of very many people. When man and woman come together, and then you are not planning very well. The foundation is not strong. The foundation is not according to the word of God. And eventually, when everything collapses, it's going to affect the children that are in that family. That's the reason why we need to think through and plan through and pray through so that you'll be able to build on the solid foundation, on the scriptural foundation. And then our homes will not collapse. I said our homes will not collapse. And what a wonderful thing, it's a glorious thing it will be if you begin to build the family and then you move on from day to day and from year to year and the, 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 the greater the number of days and the greater the number of years, the more you are enjoying that family. But you see there are people that take shortcuts. Shortcuts. They want to get it through in time. Time is going well, we know time is going, but you know, if you just uh, have a shortcut and you build a family together and you're not building with the right material and you're not building with scriptural specifications, you might discover eventually how dangerous and costly it is for you to build your home without following the divine plan. But there's something we can thank God for. That whatever the stage Whatever the situation of the family today, God can turn 
bitter things to better things. And God can turn broken homes into blessed homes. And that's the reason why we're here. I told you the other time uh, during the um, freedom celebration that when the doctor examines you and probes you, it's not doing that to hurt you. And so if we probe our families and we try to find out what kind of foundation did we lay and how did we start the family? What went wrong at the foundation? As we probe and examine and investigate, we're not trying to hurt you. We're trying to discover where is the problem so we can apply the appropriate solution. That's the reason we're looking at the study today. And I know if you've been coming to the Bible study for a long time, many of the verses we read, uh, they might be familiar to you. But after see if you are not familiar with the scriptures, in fact, when I read the scriptures, I act as if I never read that before, even though I've read it over and over, many, many times over. But I come with a, a fresh desire, a new desire. Lord, I want to see something from this passage today that had been there all the time that I never saw. That's what the people of the world, that's what they do. We've been walking over the ground for a long time. And they keep on walking on that earth. And then they say, well, there must be something underneath this earth where we are that we have never discovered and they begin to dig, they begin to dig and some of them will dig out gold some of them will dig out silver some of them will dig out oil, petroleum why? because even though the land has been there for hundreds of years, thousands of years yet they know there is still something the farmer might have planted on that land and then the farmer will say that is all I can do on that land until these people will come and they say Clear your crops away. We want to search, we want to investigate, we want to find out are there some other minerals, some other riches, some wealth inside this place we have never discovered. When you come to the Bible, that's exactly what you do. That all the understanding you had before say, Yes, thank God, I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm a child of God. I've read those scriptures before. I want to read them again to find out whether there are some things that have been missing all the time. If you come to the Bible study with that attitude, with that desire i want to get something new it will bless your family and it will bless your life but you know if you just come and say we're going to the bible study like the people that just come every time and then they do not expect to see anything. They do not expect to have any transformation or change in their lives. And they say, well, we're studying about marriage today. They know what they're going to talk about. They're going to talk about this, this, this. One, two, three. And then you're looking at your time when we finish. And then after you get back home, the same way the family was before, the family will remain like that the same way. I pray that will not happen to you. I'm dividing the message today, the study today, to three parts. That's number one, beginning of the selection process. If you're going to build a house, how do you start? You begin with the selection process, the selection of the site, the selection of the materials, the selection of everything you need to build that house. The same thing, you are going to build a home. How do you begin? You begin with the selection process. Think about this. Once you have built the building, the house, those blocks are there and they are forever there. They are there and they are forever there. And that's why you ought to be careful. Once you make your choice, the choice is made. And what else can you do? Point number two, building with a scriptural pattern. Building with a scriptural pattern. Number three, the basis of a satisfactory partnership. I come to number one, beginning with the selection process. And let's think about this now. Beginning with the selection process. When we want to make a choice, you want to select, that means you want to choose. How do we normally choose i want you to think about that almost everybody chooses on the basis of experience what's the experience of the past because you see since we were born we've been living our lives and we've gathered some experience together and therefore when we're going to make any choice any choice any choice the choice of a school 
that a child will go. The choice of a place, a city that you will live. The choice of, um, of a person you are going to get married to. We think about the past. And we think about the person. That's all we can think about. When God is making a choice, how does God make a choice? That's different from who we are. He makes his choice on the basis of the future. Think about that. We human beings make our choice. We make our selection on the basis of our experience of the past, of the people we know. Here we are in the fellowship. And you'll be meeting with this uh, lady or this uh, sister. You may see her. The way she comports herself and the way she talks and the way she respects people and the way she does this and that and the way you think she's a beautiful Christian. This is a wonderful fellow. How do you know she's wonderful? Because of what you've seen of her in the past. Not because of what you've seen of her in the future. Because you don't know the future. Only God makes selection because of what he sees in the future. We make a selection because of what we knew in the past. And you know the future is sometimes very, very different from the past. That's why we make mistakes. That's the reason why we go to God in prayer. We say, God, I can only look back. I cannot look forward. But you look forward and you see thousands of years before. That's what we're told in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 8. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. I want you to think about the beginning as being on this side and the end being on that side. And you are standing here and God is standing at the very end. And then as he stands at the very end, he knows the end from the beginning. And it's, you say you want to make a choice. Say you are. All you can see is how you feel today. What you need is today. And what you felt in the past. And you want to make a choice. And all the choice you can make will be based on what you felt in the past. And what you are feeling at this present time. And it will be far, very, very different from what is going to happen in 20 years time. You know, some of us who have married for more than 20, 25 years now. We can look back and we can say we thank God. That even though we didn't know what will happen. We didn't even know. We will live up to 20 years, 25 years in that marriage. But looking back now, we can say said God your hand was in this but you see if you're only thinking of that time and you cannot think of the future what are you going to do the end of a thing is better than the beginning thereof and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit and we're looking at um, uh, looking at chapter 8 verse 7 that same Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 7 for he knoweth not what shall be. That's talking about man, about woman. That's talking about human being. He knoweth not what shall be. For who can tell him when it shall be? Who will tell him? That is, your father cannot tell you, your mother cannot tell you, the brothers cannot tell you, hey, I respect and I appreciate the marriage committee, but you know the marriage committee cannot tell you what will happen in 10 years' time. I love the marriage committee. We'll put the marriage committee there. But the marriage committee cannot tell you what will happen in 25 years' time. All those people in the marriage committee, all our counselors, all our supporters, all the people that are encourage, encouraging us, hey, don't miss this man. Don't miss this woman. This is the woman you ought to get. This is the man you ought to get. Why are they saying that? They're only saying that on the basis of what they knew of that woman, of that man of the past but 25 years time 30 years time if jesus tarries 50 years time how many of them can tell what will happen to that woman what will happen to that man who can tell you what will happen in the future that's why if you make your choice on the basis of what those people are saying you're going to be hooked up and linked up and tied up and pinned up to the past we're told uh, we're told in uh, Isaiah chapter 46 Isaiah 46 I'm reading from verse 10 declaring the end from the beginning 
declaring the end from the beginning. That's the almighty God. Nobody can do that. Nobody can tell you the end from the beginning. Your daddy cannot tell you. Your mommy cannot tell you. Your friends cannot tell you. And the counselors cannot tell you. Telling you, declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. The things that are not yet done. What can we tell you? The things that are already done. What can we tell you? The things we already know about the sister. What can we tell you? The things we already know about the brother. But who can tell you the things that are not yet done? It says in that, in, in that place, it says, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Let me show you an example of what we're reading. For Samuel chapter 8. For Samuel chapter 8. The beginning, we're beginning with the selection process. Here were the children of Israel. They wanted a king. And uh, how did they want a king? Let me show you for Samuel chapter 8. Reading from verse 9. Now therefore, hearken unto their voice. How be it protest, yet protest solemnly unto them. And show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. Show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them now the children of israel what were they thinking about once again they're thinking of all they had known their past and the experiences of people around them and look at verse 19 nevertheless the people refused to obey the voice of samuel and they said nay but we'll have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, here is what they were thinking about. They had seen the experience and the history, the lifestyle of other nations in the past. Here is how it happened unto them. Therefore, choose us a king. And we know that if we have a king... That king will be able to fight our battles for us. And then God said, Samuel, listen to them. But you tell them the future of that king. They couldn't know that. Nobody else could tell them that. To tell them the future of the king that will reign over them. In verse 10, and Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself. That was not in their plan. Their plan is that the man will come and lead them in battle and defeat the enemies. This one that the Lord was telling them, this is the future. This is what is going to happen. That was not in their mind at all. And then it says... He will take of your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots, and to be his horsemen. And, he sh and some shall run before his chariots. And will appoint him captains over thousands, and captains over fifties. And will set them to, uh, to, to hear his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and, uh, and instruments of his chariots. Everything is going to take what you have unto himself. It's not going to help you. You are going to help him. It's, going, it's not going to sacrifice for you. You are going to make the greatest sacrifice of your life for that man. He's going to oppress you. All that they did not know, all they knew was the present scene. You remember what I said last week? Emotion is stronger than knowledge. One day, once the emotion is there, and if, if you don't understand, you know that this is just emotion. And the emotion of today can make you to take a decision that will ruin the rest of your life. But to understand, the emotion will soon fade away. Emotion of 10 minutes, the emotion of one day, the emotion of one year of, or one week can ruin the rest of your life. Why don't you just say now, knowledge is important. Knowledge is power. 
And knowledge is the essential thing. Emotion will come and go. But knowledge is stable. Knowledge is constant. And knowledge is, it does not depreciate. Knowledge is there all the time. Why don't you understand then? Because knowledge is important, I'm going to allow my knowledge to rule my emotion, my feeling. Uh, why do people drink and they don't know when to stop? Feeling and emotion. Why do people smoke and they do not think of the consequences, the feeling, the taste, the emotion? Why do people get into hard drugs and they hurt themselves and they kill themselves? The emotion. But if those people will first of all have knowledge, you know, if you have knowledge before the emotion rises up, when the emotion is coming, you'll be, you'll be able to say, hey, wait, wait a minute. I have knowledge that that thing will ruin my life. But if you don't have any knowledge and all you have is just this flesh and the pleasure and the desire and the emotion, you will ruin yourself and destroy yourself before your time. And these people, all they wanted, will want a king, will want a king. And Samuel was telling them, this is how that king will be. And then he tells us in verse 13, and it will take your daughters to be confessionaries and to be cooks and to be bakers. And it will take, it will take your fields and your vineyards and your olive yards and even the best of them and give them to his servants. This man coming will really do havoc to the nation. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants and he will take your main servants and your main mid servants and your goodliest young men and your asses and put them to his work he will take the tenth of your sheep and he shall, and ye shall be his servants and ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which he shall have chosen and the lord will not hear you in that day then they said nevertheless the people refused to uh, the, to obey the voice of samuel why emotion is stronger than knowledge this knowledge is coming too late you're telling us of what will happen in the future we feel so strong about our desire today that we cannot listen to you about what you are saying in the future. Give us a king. And then they said in verse, uh, in verse 20 that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Fight our battles. Well, as a result of this uh, desire, this pressure on the prophet Samuel, who did they choose as the first king? You know the name? Okay. And the greatest battle he faced uh, because they wanted somebody to go before them and fight their battles for them. Do you remember chapter 17 of 1 Samuel? And Goliath came out for how many days? 40 days. And Goliath said, now, children of Israel, here is, here I am. Choose a man that you'll be able to fight uh, with me. If he defeats me, then will be your servant. If I defeat him, then Israel will be the servants of the Philistines. And they were looking at one another. Where is our king? This is why we chose you. This is the challenge. This is the time now. Prove yourself that we chose you for this purpose. And Saul was nowhere to be found when Goliath came out and he saw Goliath and ran away. His knees were knocking together until God's own man came. Somebody they would never have chosen. And he came, that's David. And he said, don't worry about the man. Because you know, when God makes the choice... Is that one that God chooses that will actually be able to fulfill the desires of your heart? The one that they chose by themselves could not fulfill the desires of their heart to kill or to destroy their enemies. But God said, I found a man after my own heart. And it was that man after God's own heart that was able to win their battles for them. That's why it's very important that we wait upon the Lord, we call upon the Lord and say, Lord, help us. We need your help. Now, in making the choice, we pray. But it's not only prayer. And you know, there are people that think that everything the believer does, just pray. 
And sometimes our young people uh, they say that uh, they do not, uh, they do not uh, know this subject and this subject, and you know uh, the council of say pray. I appreciate that the children ought to pray. Can they do more than prayer? They have to do more than prayer. And then sometimes you are having a business, and in that business, the business is not going on well. And then you go to you, you talk to people. They say, you say, here am I. I'm handling this business, and I commit so much money to everything is gone. Oh, they say, pray. I appreciate that. You have to pray, but you need to do more than prayer. Check up. Are you following success principles? Check up in the word of God. Who are the people you are linked up together with in that business? And those students who are there, you're very poor in a particular subject. What are you going to do? You will, yes, I know you will pray, but you'll do something. It reminds me of, you know, a particular meeting we had about three weeks ago in the United States. And in that uh, meeting, I don't know whether I've told you, uh, they called uh, one of the pastors there in Atlanta, Georgia, to introduce me to the people because there were people there that didn't know much about me. And the brother stood up and the brother said, well, I'm happy to introduce the pastor today. Of all of you that are here, of all the deeper life in the whole world, Nigeria everywhere, I don't know any other person that knows the general superintendent more than me. And I was listening to him. They, they wondered what he was going to say. And then he said, well, we're in the same school together. And he was one year ahead of me. Now they listen to him. Then this he said, I'll never forget, he was very good in sciences. He wanted to study, uh, you know, have a degree in science. But his mathematics were very, very bad. And then in my own class, I was a class ahead of him. He came to me and he said that, you know, he said, I asked him, what will I do? I am very, very poor in this mathematics. What will I do? And then he reminded me and reminded the all, all, and told all the people what I told him. I said, take that textbook and then go back to page one and read and study from page one. Every difficult, every difficult thing there, bring it back to me. I will help you. But solve every problem. Read every example. He said he did that and he came from 20-something position to the fourth position in that class. I thought you were going to put your hands together for Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, when somebody who had known you from 1958, when it comes to deeper life, and they were almost of the same age, and yet he can submit to my leadership and then tell all the rest of the people, you don't know the man, I know the man. Then you understand that you know this fellow really knows what he's talking about. My point is this, when he said, I'm very poor bad in mathematics, I didn't say go and pray. Yes, prayer is good, but I said go and read, go and study, do something. So then, if you're going to get married, what do you do? Pray. Yes, I know. That's what we've been telling you. That's what everybody tells you. Pray. But look, open your eyes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, if somebody, if you're a believer, and somebody is a non-believer, and they say, pray. You know, you open your eyes. That's what is a non-believer. That one God cannot choose that one. Somebody is an idol worshiper and you have the juju ring in the hand and you say, I'm, I'm feeling love to this man. I'm going to pray. Don't pray. Open your eyes and see. If that fellow is an unbeliever, you don't have any business praying. And you know, sometimes as a pastor, as an, a counselor, people come to me and they say, Pastor, I don't understand. That, you know, although the man is an unbeliever, but I feel love towards the man. That's emotion. Emotion is stronger than knowledge. Kick up the emotion and understand that the word of God has told you what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. It's not only that you pray. If that man is an unbeliever, if that lady is an unbeliever, you, you allow your knowledge to override and to overwhelm and to cancel, crush, and wipe out your emotion. Don't ever allow your emotion to lead you and lead you towards anybody that the Bible has given us knowledge that this is an unbeliever. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
in second corinthians chapter 6 we're reading from verse reading from verse 14 second corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 14 be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion has light with darkness uh, you, you know the way uh, brothers and sisters you need to learn from us you need to learn from us we're going to choose for example a region of us here what do i do do i just go and kneel down and pray oh god i need the region of us here for that place yes i pray but i ask questions i said well that man of what language is he and we're sending him to we need the region of us here for this region does he speak their language? Does he understand them? Not only that, that place we have high shots there. That is where professors and vice chancellors and you know scientists, all those people there. It's a, you know it's a city that is well built up, and we want a region of us here there. Yes, we're going to pray. Before we pray, we we'll find out this other person is saved, is sanctified, is baptized in the Holy Ghost. If he, if he didn't go to school, you, you can get saved and not go to school. You can get sanctified and not read primary six. And you can get filled with the Holy Ghost and never, and never even, uh, never even st step into the doors of his school. And then we want to have a region of us here for a place where the people don't understand. They don't speak the local language. All the language they speak is English. And we do we just close our eyes and pray and then we say that's the person the lord has chosen and then we send him there it's going to make a mess of yes we pray but we open our eyes to see we ask questions this person that uh, you know we have from this place what has he done as a zona leader what has he done as a coordinator what has he done as a group coordinator and when he preaches does he understand the bible yes we know he's saved but does he preach right does he stand on the watch of god even in choosing coordinators here why don't we just pray why don't we just pray and say now praise the lord we need a coordinator for that district who have been praying now okay my mind goes to that brother and then i say you god said be a coordinator there. No. We interview them. Why do we interview them? We want to know them. We want to understand. Are they believers? If they are believers, are they suitable? And the same thing. When you are going to choose a life partner. You know, even choosing a coordinator is very simple. If you choose a coordinator, if it's not doing well, you can call him and say, my brother, this is not okay. You are not doing well. And we'll replace them. But once you choose the wife, you cannot replace her. Once you choose the husband, you cannot replace him. You are married, you are married. Even to choose a state of us here, or to choose a region of us here, or to choose a nation of us here. If we make a mistake and we discover, we just call him and say, brother, looks like we made a mistake in choosing you to leave that region, that state, that nation. And we remove them and we put another person there. In the case of marriage, you cannot do that. If those of us who are putting people on a region, on a state, on a nation, and we know we can change them if we made mistake, if we still find out, if we investigate, if we look at their lives with all the recommendations anybody can give, and we still find out about them, why don't you understand then that you have to find out? That's the reason we have courtship time. And that's the reason you ask questions. If you said this is of God and you said you are prayed, at that time of the courtship is when you are asking questions. And then at that time, you may discover something. And then what you discover is that the fellow, although he says he's saved and is coming to the church, the way you are discussing and the answers is given looks like this man is an unequal yoke with me. And then you can still make a remedy at that time. So it's not just that you pray, you find out, you open your eyes and you see and you look and you see the commitment and the yieldedness and the surrender and the submission of those people to the scriptures. And let's go on in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 15. And what conquers Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believeth with an infidel? 
or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Now, you understand, even when people say they are saved, they are born again, the children of God, and they have given their lives to the Lord. You know, if I were you, if you are not married yet, I will not just say because somebody says he's born again, I'll check up. That born again, I'll find out, is this person really born again? Is this fellow really a child of God? You'll find out. If you don't find out, I'll just say, well, he gives me the testimony and I believe their testimony. You might find out when you get into the marriage eventually and that time you cannot come out. You might find out they said they were born again, but they were not born again. That's why you find out. And even if you say, I am sure, still check up that I am sure. Still find out that I am sure. And then we're told in um, Deuteronomy chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're reading from verse 1. Here we're told, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and has cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gagashites, and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. If they are unbelievers, if they do not, if they do not understand the way of the Lord, they are not born again, they are not children of God, you must not make marriages with them. Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Amos chapter 3. I'm reading to you from verse 3. In Amos chapter 3 verse 3. Here it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together except they be agreed? Let me ask you a simple difficult question. A simple question because everybody should understand. A difficult question because once your emotion gets involved, this question is very difficult to answer. Can two people be born again and still be in disagreement on many, many issues? Yes or no? Yes. Two people can be born again, but they see different sides of the same issue. How many children are you going to have? We see different sides of the same issue. Will you still want to go to school after we have married? We see different sides. Some people, someone will say yes, the other says no. And would it be all right for me to, you know, keep my job uh, while we get the marriage? While we get the marriage through, some will, some men will say, "No, you cannot keep your job in another place." And I'm here, and I want you to be a full time housewife. You have to think about all that. It's not just that she's born again, she's sanctified, she's deep alive. Can two people be deep alive and still not be in agreement together? Yes, yes. It's not just that you are deeper life together. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Why do you argue with one another? Because you are not in agreement. Why do we kind of force and you know there's no peace in them? Because there's no agreement. All that we should have checked up before the emotion took over. Can two walk together except they be agreed? You must find out are we in agreement? What's your purpose in life? What's your goal in life? What are you going to do in life? And what's the other fellow going to do in life? Friends and brothers and sisters as well, we have courtship. After you have said, yes, I'm sure this is the will of God. That's just 50%. You're not married yet. And during that courtship is when you find out in your discussions together. Don't make the discussion superficial. 
Don't make it superficial. And that sister, beloved sister, she's born again, she's sanctified, and she's filled with the Holy Ghost, but she had a child or two children in her secondary school. It was uh, maybe a careless uh, situation. But now the children are there. And the mother is a mother. The mother will want those children to come and live with her when she eventually gets married. Now, discuss that. Now, I have two children already. And these two children, you know, they, their father did not claim them because of the situation that happened when I was in the secondary school. When I get married, I want those children to be with me. Are you in agreement with that? Some men will say, I'm sorry, I cannot accept that. I would want my own children. So the children you have got, before you get to me, you have to see how to take care of them. A mother is a mother. The heart of the mother is going to be on those children. If you are in disagreement on that, think through before you marry. Because it's not just I prayed, I know the will of God. You find out if we're in agreement on these basic important things. And, so, and there are many other things you ought to think about too to make sure that you are in agreement. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 29. And I'm reading there from verse 24. Whoso is partner to a thief, hateth his own soul. If you are a partner to a thief, a partner to a sinner, a partner to somebody who doesn't know the Lord, you hurt yourself, you hate yourself, and you know, you'll know you suffer for it. Now, then we pray. Of course, we pray. But if you don't know how to pray for little, little things, how would you know how to pray for big, big things? And we shouldn't kid ourselves or deceive ourselves. You know, somebody has a little headache, he cannot pray, and the headache will go away. And now he has, you know, somebody else has cancer. And you cannot pray for headache to go away. You want to pray for cancer to go away. How will that be possible? That's the reason why, if you say you are going to pray for life partner, life partner, that's a big, big thing. That's a big request. Are you able to pray for a little job? No. Ah, don't. You cannot tell me you can pray for life partner when you cannot even pray and get a job. You cannot even pray and get some little, little things. You cannot pray and get accommodation. And you want to pray for a bigger thing and have life partner. That means then, if you're really going to show that you can pray and you can have life partner, you must be able to pray and have accommodation and pray and have job and pray and have the necessities of life. You know, sometimes uh, people, uh, they want to say, and, and it's emotion. They want to, you know, rule the church by emotion. They say, we don't understand what the church is doing like this. They said, you know, I could not, uh, you know, bring in a woman. I could not bring in the wife. No accommodation yet. No job yet. Why are you going to live? Why are they thinking? Why don't they stand on faith? Why don't those people, why don't just they teach us faith and understand with God? All things are possible. Job or no job. Accommodation or no accommodation. I found a wife. You have not found a wife yet. Because if you say you have faith, we should be asking you, why don't you have faith and pray and get accommodation? You shouldn't fight with the church. Why shouldn't you pray, have faith, and have a job, and have livelihood so that you can feed yourself? Does a, does a person that has faith, does he go about begging? You go about begging for food and begging for money. And then you say you have faith. That's not faith. If you have faith, you stop begging and then you go on your knees and pray, Lord, I need a job. I need accommodation. And then you put your faith into action. And then we see this man has faith. He has used his faith. He has got accommodation. He has used his faith and he has got a job. He has used his faith and he has stopped begging. And now he can feed himself. Now I can trust you that you have used your faith and you have got a life partner. Because you have shown the proof. You used your faith, you got this. You used your faith and you got this. Give me your testimony. How you have used your faith before. 
You see, that is, that is how it is. It's not just that, you know, you're accusing the church. Why doesn't the church have faith? And they're telling me, get this, get that, before I get married. You must get all those things. We need to spend time on this because it's bringing confusion, unnecessary problem to our church. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, ask and it shall be given unto you. Give me a good amen. Amen. Seek and ye shall find. No case shall be open unto you. For every one that hath receiveth, he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be open. I come to point number two. Building with a scriptural pattern. Building with a scriptural pattern. Now, as we come to uh, learn about building the family, building the home, how do you build according to scriptural pattern? It's the word of God that actually builds us up. We're told in Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 32. Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of of his grace, which is able to build you up. Uh, can I tell you something? When the builders are building a house, they look at the pattern, they look at the sketch, they look at the drawing that the architect had given them. It's not a matter of whether it's convenient to them or not, whether they think this block should be here or not. This is the pattern. Whatever they felt, whoever they were, Wherever they went to school, wherever they went for their training, they are to follow the pattern. The same thing. The word of God has given us exactly what to do in the family. Whatever our background may be, whatever our experience may be, whatever our feeling may be, we just do what the word of God has said. And you know the problem we have? You know sometimes we, uh, we do things based on feeling. And that's, uh, we need to change that. We should do things based on on knowledge do things based on knowledge let me tell you what i mean you know, you know sometimes say we you want to eat you know that the food will bring nutrients to your body vitamin to your body you need it to keep alive you may not have appetite but you still have to eat if you are wise and mature you force yourself to eat not because you like it not because you want to. Even when you don't want to, you still do it. Because, again, that is knowledge. The knowledge that this food will keep me alive. I don't like to eat now. I don't feel like eating now. But I must eat because it will keep me alive. And many, many things we do. Uh, that if we went, if we leaned upon a, a feeling will not be able to do what is right let's say for example you are going on the way with your vehicle and somebody bumped at you and that is uh, collided with you and as you look at the fellow you know the feeling you have when you are wanting when you want to come out is that this man i'll show him something and then the fellow comes out of his car he has a gun and he's an army officer and he looks at this and say what happened you cannot use your feeling that if you use your feeling at that time the man has a gun in his hand you use your knowledge you say i'm sorry <laughs> you know he should say sorry but he has a gun and people who hold gun don't say they are sorry therefore immediately you use your knowledge not your fear say i am sorry sir and then he says go your way <laughs> and then you say how lucky am i the man will not shoot me i know he was wrong you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes you are going on the way and you meet a drunkard. And the drunkard wants to, you know, hurt your life. And what do you do? You have, you have the right of the way. The way you feel, you should, if, if you went through your feeling, you strike the man. But you cannot choose your feeling. The man is drunk. If you know he will hurt you. You use your knowledge. Use the knowledge every time. If we can do that, you'll become more matured. You'll not be walking on the way you feel and acting on the way you feel and doing things because this is the way you feel. You use your knowledge rather than your feeling. That's the same thing in marriage. You know, in marriage, there are some things we're given in the world 
word of God how to build a family. And whether we feel like it or not, whether we feel this is all right or not, we just know this is the word of God. And we use that. We build that, that is, we build the marriage on the basis of the word. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm reading to you from verse 25, from verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. If you're dependent on feeling, you can't do that every time. You have to rely on knowledge to do that. And then it says, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto their own husbands in everything. Ah, you have to use your knowledge of the word of God to be able to obey that. If you depend upon your feeling, that will be very much impossible. Verse 25, it says, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. If I were to ask the men here, are there times to just feel, don't answer, don't raise up your hand. You know, this, uh, this is a difficult question for you to answer in the public. Are there times uh, when you just feel, huh, God, give me grace. It will take grace to love this woman. Yes, there are times like that. But you don't depend on your feeling. You know, there are times you feel, why is this woman acting like this? Why is this woman behaving like this? Why is this woman, you know, talking like this? And then at that time, your, your love may want to go down. Why does she talk to my mother like that? Why does she behave to the children like that? Why is it this? My brothers and sisters came and she said she was tired and she couldn't even get up and give them food. And if you depended on your feeling at that time, you know what you're going to do? You're going to love her less. That's the time you say, feeling, can you retreat? Can you go back? And my knowledge, can you advance? Can you come to the front line? I need to love this woman because this is knowledge. This is the word of God. You will not allow your feeling of what you see of the situation to hinder you. You see, the maturity we have is because we're too emotional. And we depend so much on how we feel. But if you just walk by knowledge, this is what you do. Whatever I feel, however I feel, cold or hot, warm or lukewarm, whatever... Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church. And that's what the Lord is telling us well to do. We're going to do it in Jesus' name. In, in that same chapter 5, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Do I understand that? Yes. He that loveth his wife, the wife will make your food sweeter when she knows that you love her. And the wife will clean up the house better when, when she knows she's appreciated. If you love her, you actually push her to work more. And you push her to be more faithful. And you lead her to, you know, to do things for you that she'll never dream of doing. You know, sometimes you can, you know, you can do it at home. You just say, you know, I appreciate you. I love you. And this is just wonderful. There's no other person I could have married. You know, all the adjectives you have learned from me in the Bible study, just you know throw it to your wife and then uh, thank you very much and then <laughs> praise the lord and then you will find your food that evening will be sweeter and then you say how is it that you are cooking this uh, you know and she puts uh, you know more things and everything like that and then in the morning you know if she's not been waking up in the morning to prepare food for you before you go to work in the night just say you know how wonderful you are and you, you know every time i just i just see you you just you just make me happy I'm the happiest person, not because of money, just because of you. If that woman had been waking up late in the morning, early in the morning, on you know the following, she's going to wake up and prepare you a breakfast before you go. Why? She's happy. 
She's happy. Love your wife and you love yourself. Because of the way she's going to respond back to you. And because of the way she's going to do things for you. Because of that love. That's what the Lord is telling us. You see, when you don't love your wife, you're hurting yourself. If you frown at her, she's unhappy. If she's unhappy, she'll not be able to do everything she ought to do in the family to help you and to build you up and to assist you. But when she's happy, when she knows you appreciate her, when she knows that you love her, when she knows that, you know, everything is for her. You know, if you're tested, people don't understand. You don't understand that when you love people, you make them to do more than they could ever do. If you, if, let's say you have money. And then you're holding on to it. She'll be holding on to her money too. But you have money. And say, you see, uh, my wife, I'm sorry for the past. The money that I got now from the office, this is the whole thing. I don't want to touch it anymore. You are the manageress of the home now. And then she takes the money. And then she comes to you in the evening and said, my husband, I didn't want to tell you, but because of what you did in the money, and you gave me all that money, do you know that I had 100,000 naira? You? Where did you keep that? I'm telling you. Because you were keeping your own, I was keeping my own. Now that you have brought your own, I bring my own. When you love her, she will love you back. And that means that you are helping yourself. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, and, but nourishes and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church, for we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh one flesh that means then we need to build up the family how do you really build up the family let christ come into that family in john chapter 4 verse 53 john chapter 4 verse 53 so the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which jesus said unto him thy son liveth and himself believed and his whole house himself believed and his whole house that's how to build the family when you bring christ into the family acts of the apostles chapter 16 verse 13 acts chapter 16 verse 13 and brought them out and said sirs what must i do to be saved and they said Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and was washed, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, and he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he said, Meet before them, and rejoice, believing in God with all his house. If you bring Christ into the family. The husband is saved. The wife is saved. The children are saved. That's how to build the family and make you have a happy, joyful, righteous family. Luke chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zechariah, that's the husband, of the cause of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, Zechariah's and Elizabeth. Look at verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. That's how to build the family. They were both righteous before God. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That's what the Lord wants of the family. And when the family is like that, you'll be building the family according to scriptural pattern. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. In First Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue, both of them. She, the wife, will be saved in childbearing if they, the husband and the wife, continue, number one, in faith. Number two, in charity. Number three, in holiness. Number three, was, number four, with sobriety. That means when we are like that, then we're able to actually follow the word of the Lord. And then we're going to have the days of heaven on earth. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 18. 
Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontless before you, between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the door, the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied. That your days may be multiplied. That your days may be multiplied. You know, the, the family, if there's family trouble, somebody can die prematurely. Family trouble may bring hypertension. Family trouble may bring heart attack. Family problem may bring malnutrition. Family problem may bring all kinds of worry and anxiety. But when there's, when there's peace in the family, when there's joy, rest of mind in the family, when there's contentment in the family, when the family is built up according to the word of the Lord, you wake up in the morning, there is no concern, there is no problem, there's no worry, there's no anxiety. The man has gone out, there is no fear. Maybe he's gone to meet other women. The woman has gone out, uh, there is no suspicion. Maybe the woman is messing up somewhere that you don't know. But there's peace, there's rest, there's trust, there's joy, there's trustworthiness. It just You are healthy. And then the woman, you know, cooks the food and, and she prepares the very best and the man puts all the money down that is needed in the family and that family will just have joy and peace and there's no concern but you know when you have family problem and you know heart attack comes in and hypertension comes in and sickness comes in and depression comes in how many women are there in the world even in in churches that they have depression just because of family problem how many men are depressed and unhappy just because of family problems? If all these family problems are taken away and there's nothing to worry about, even if you have moderate accommodation, you have moderate, uh, moderate substance or moderate job, because of the peace and the rest of mind, you'll be healthy, you'll be strong. And, and so, if we keep to the word of God, we're helping ourselves. If we don't keep to the word of God, we're hurting ourselves. Now, many doctors will tell you that uh, about, uh, some say 75%, some say 80% of sicknesses in the world, they are the effect of the mind on the body. The effect of the mind on the body. You know, somebody just saying, you know, I think, I don't know whether I'm in the right place or not. You know, I learned of a person who was a medical doctor himself. He had cancer and was given about six months to leave. He went to see another doctor. And this other doctor said, why do you have this cancer? Is there something in your life? that you really are not happy about, that is making you, that you see, we have your body, your thoughts, and the way you think, and the way you live, it makes the chemical things in your body to react one way or the other, affecting your cells, affecting your muscles, and everything. And so this other doctor has the doctor that had the cancer, having six months to live. What is it that is bothering you? And then this doctor having cancer confessed to the other doctor, I didn't want to be a doctor. I wanted to be an architect and uh, but my parents said no you must be a doctor and they forced me into it but i've not been a happy person and every time i'm you all do i'm doing it well and all right but i'm not a happy person and so the other doctor said well you're a medical doctor now and you know you have six months to live and you know that there's no cure really for this cancer all they can do for you is just to slow down the deterioration of the cells in your body but all the same why don't you then give it a trial go and study your spare time now uh, architecture and uh, just 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 enjoy yourself and study what you want to study now you've satisfied your parents that wanted you to be a doctor you've satisfied them now do what you want to do and the men went into architecture just began to study all of a sudden because he was not in the thing he wanted to he was very happy and he forgot that he was even sick and was studying nothing before the six months expire i'm going to study more the six months came he did not die it's not, it's not even a Christian 
this is just normal sin because you see the body just relaxing and resting, just happy. And you are, you are just with yourself, you are in love with yourself, you are happy within yourself. And then one year passed, the man has not died. Then before five years, he had got a degree in architecture and then the cancer had totally gone away. Because the mind, the mind was not happy and the mind now want, was just doing what he wanted to do. You know, in our families, when it's like, you know, the wife is just forcing herself to, you know, do this and do that. The depression, the dissatisfaction and the disease that will come. But when there's love in the family and everybody is happy together, there's no concern. There's nothing you are worried about. You are worried about. And, uh, you know, as we finish uh, the Bible study, you go back home and then by 10 10 o'clock or maybe 10 30 once you lie on the bed you are gone isn't that better than you know you are there 10 o'clock uh, 11 o'clock and by one o'clock you are still rolling on the bed what that man said against me this man the man is nodding already but you are thinking uh, you know this man doesn't consider anybody's life and you know this is the way we are how many years am i going to spend this this kind of home then while the man will be looking at the man this man and he says he's a christian and we're living in this house and the way he's treating me even if if he was not a christian how how else will he treat me he says he's a christian and he, and he's killing me like this and you know the woman is not even till one o'clock the following day the following day the following day how will that woman not be sick but if the man will just wake up and say my wife i'm sorry i hurt you we went to the bible story today everything the pastor was saying even though i was laughing just to laugh with the other people but i but I knew that, you know, the pastor was talking to me. My wife, please, don't vex. I'm sorry now. That woman will begin to sleep that night. You know, all this prayer and fasting that you do to get them healed, if you will just do right at home, your wife will be well. And your husband will be healthy. And the children will be happy also. And you will live long in Jesus' name. Look at verse 21 that your days may be multiplied and the day as and the days of your children in the land which the Lord's wear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Well, have that in Jesus' name. Point number three: the basis of a satisfactory partnership. The basis of a satisfactory partnership. The partnership we're talking about actually began from Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 reading from verse 24 Genesis chapter 2 reading from verse 24 therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh one flesh you know just that that's the partnership and we're told in Matthew chapter 19 Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 5, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they, and, and they twain shall be one flesh. Think about that, one flesh. And as you think about your husband, uh, your, your, your husband, and maybe you think about your wife, uh, you must be thinking. And uh, you know for us, uh, uh, look up here, for us who preach, I don't know how some people preach. I don't know how some people preach. Hey, you know some people, uh, they can preach all this. They shall be one flesh. And even though they are preaching, they know there are some things they are hiding deliberately from their wives. And sometimes, you know, when I hear people preach and I know some little, little things about them, I wonder, how can these people preach with real conscience? real conscience that you're preaching and you're coaching the bible therefore shall a man leave father and mother and then your mother is still living with you and you quote it leave father and mother and then shall cleave unto his wife and you are nearer the maid than, than you are to your wife and yet you're coaching i don't know how other people preach you know for me if i preach the word of god i preach to you i preach to myself i ask myself am i like that and i don't have any business preaching it if i cannot leave it out and you don't have any business preaching it if you cannot leave it out there shall be one flesh is there anything my hand is hiding from my brain? Not possible. Is there anything my ear is hiding from my brain? Not possible. Is there anything I am hiding from my wife? Ah, she must not see this. She must not know this. She must not be told this. How then are we one? And if there's anything you are hiding from your wife, 
you know, I'm striking this business deal with you. If you come to our house, just call me out. Don't talk about it when my wife is there. Uh, you want flesh. Or maybe you are the woman, you are discussing something, even with another woman. I'm not talking from morality now. I'm talking of something, maybe clean business. But you want to get this, but please, anytime you come to see me in the house, if my husband is there, don't mention this. Because I want to carry the house to the Linton level before he knows. Because if he knows, I don't know what he will do. How are you on flesh? If we're hiding from one another, and then you're keeping that money, I hope my husband never sees this. I hope my wife never sees this. You know, you're preaching, and then it says you shall be one flesh. And then you have a particular key to the room, to the cupboard, that the wife doesn't know anything about. My husband, it looks like, you know, you're always holding the key to this room. Is it, you know, you're, you're prognosing too much. Is it everything that you all know? Uh, I'm holding a key and, and so what? What's the meaning of that? If there's no meaning to that, drop it and let us see. <laughs> let's go into that room and let's, let's open this cupboard. Or do you have an idol there? Do you have something? Do you have an exhibit inside there? No, it's Naira that is there. You know, if we really want flesh, want flesh, then we're open to one another. We're open to one another. And that's where the money is. That's where those things are. You know, even in Christian things, there are, you know, Christians that will say, ah, don't touch my Bible. Even Bible, Bible. The wife cannot take, you know, my husband, I want to check out something in your concordance. Don't go and buy yours. Don't, don't touch my Bible. Husband and wife. Why don't you put everything together? That's what it means to become one. We are one. The Bible, the commentaries, the books, the money, the clothes, the rooms, everything that we have. We have everything together. Now, if, if it has not been like that in the past, well, that's past. Our future is going to be different. From tonight, we just open those doors and then we say, okay, my wife now, actually the door even has a duplicate key. So I kept the duplicate, I kept the original. Now you can have the duplicate. And now, do you mean that anytime I want to take any book there, I'm free? Did it, were you not at the Bible study tonight? Now you are free. I said we're free. That's what it means to be one. This is Bible study. It's not just doctrine. You know, all these doctrines, we know it already. But now from tonight, we're going to go back home. We're going to do it. We will do it. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. And the multitude of them that believe of one heart, of, of one soul, neither said any that aught of the things which they possess was his own, but they had all things common. That's the oneness. That's the one flesh. We are one. And because we are one, we have one heart, we have one soul, neither said any of the things that they possess that is their own, but they had all things common. We're going to have all things common. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, that there should be no schism, no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. The members should have the same care one for another. When the wife is sick, the husband is taking care. When the wife is, when the husband is sick, the wife is being considerate as well. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Romans chapter 12. We're reading from verse 10. Romans 12, verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Be kindly affectioned one to the other. Then in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, husband and wife. You know, there are times as we relate with one another. And sometimes we think that, you know, the husband does not know, but he knows. Sometimes we think the wife does not know, but she knows. And, you know, what a wonderful thing it will be. And we're not talking about sin. 
Well, if there is sin, it has to be confessed. But you know, some little, little things. You know, you told me to bring that thing back home for you. I'm sorry, I just forgot. You know, I always forget. You need to pray for me. I'm forgetful. I don't like the way I'm forgetful. I'm sorry, I forgot. That solves the problem. Confess your faults one to another. Now you are going to, you should have gone to deposit that money in the bank. You know, this society now, we, if we keep such amount of money in the house, um, you know, these people may come and steal everything. Therefore, don't keep, once it reaches, it go beyond say, 5,000 naira, don't keep it else, go and deposit it in the bank. And then you have about 23,000 in the house. And then you come back, uh, uh, I hope he doesn't remember that uh, have I gone to deposit the money or not? Before he even talks about it, confess your false one to another. My husband, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, you know, an important thing. You told me if it's more than 5,000, always take it to the bank. Those small, small things. You know, if we settle those small, small things every day, and we don't have a hang up of, you know, hangover of, you know, this offense and that offense and that offense, whenever it happens, confess your false one to another, and then it says, and Pray one for another. You pray one for another, and then it says that he may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We're going to be together. And the Lord will help us to have compassion, to have consideration for one another, and then to keep the same faith together. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you, or else be absent, I may hear of your fears, that you stand fast in one spirit. Husband and wife, stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We care for one another, we love one another, we appreciate one another, we help one another, and we do everything. What you want her to do to you, you do to her. What you want him to do to you, you do also to him. I believe that as we take all these things to heart and we really work on them, we're going to succeed in Jesus' name. And our families will be happy in Jesus' name. Uh, now, uh, when we get back home today, uh, you, you know, on the way where you are going, think about something you learned at the Bible study. And you say, yes, I'm going to put this into practice, this into practice. Can I tell you something? If we want to change our family situation, it will take, uh, you know, those who have studied human behavior and change. They tell us it takes about 21 days. If, if you, when you get back home today, for example, if uh, whatever is happening to your wife, if in the past you never cared, you know, it's, uh, you know, holding the head, and then you are thinking she started again, she's acting as if now she's tired, and the way she's acting is like, uh, you know, she's... Uh, giving me an indication she cannot go to the kitchen, you cannot go to this. Now she's holding the head. That's the way you think in the past. Now you want to change. And then you, you force yourself to say, my dear, what's happening? Are you having a headache? Or are you tired or something? All right, I'll go and take the water. I'll go and take this. You never did that before. Now do that today. Then tomorrow, look for something you will do that you've not been doing before. Then another day, by the time you do that for 21 days, then it becomes a habit for you. And then everything will turn out. The same thing with the wife. You know, if uh, whenever the husband, you know, we study our husbands, uh, you know, those of us who are, who are wives, uh, you know, she is not, wants to see the shape of the face and the look of the face. Uh, maybe he's thinking about something. In the past, you just go to your room or you go to the kitchen or you go to the, you know, the, ch in the children's room and you are singing with the children. Uh, you know, we're not alone. God is with us. Everything is all right. You know, whether the world is happy or not, we're always happy. Jesus makes us happy. That's the way you did in the past because the man has started again. I don't want him to jump on me because that way his face is looking, is, is coming out with something. But you know, now that we've studied the Bible, you change. And then once you see his face like that, my dear, something is happening. The way you are looking looks like you need my attention. What can I do for you? You need water, you need this and all that. And then you smile, and he is not smiling. Then you smile more, and he is more, not smiling. Then you bring something, you know, in his heart. You'll be thinking, this woman wants me to smile. Wants me, I'm not going to smile. And then eventually, as you continue that good way, then he will change. 
I said it will change. And if you do that today and do that tomorrow and do that another day, in 21 days, everything will become a habit and the family will turn around. Everything will be wonderful. And then, and I will hear your testimony and then I will be happy that I taught a good Bible study and the Bible study turned your family around. We will do it. I said we will do it. Rise up and let us pray together. And just take all these small, small things we talk about and all these small problems we talk about and let's solve them so we can have a happier family and the Lord will help us. You talk to the Lord in prayer and if your wife confesses any fault to you, to you. Don't jump on them. Don't accuse them. Just forgive and just love one another. Let the love of Christ, let the love of Christ be magnified in our hearts, be deepened in our hearts. And let us say, Lord, we thank you for what you have taught us. And we're going to live according to your word. We're going to live according to your word. Have a happy family, a healthy family, a holy family, a satisfied family, a contented family family a family that is built solidly on the word of god those little little things god give me grace god give me grace maybe just to change your facial appearance just to remove the frown and just to smile just to help just to care just to greet just to say good word just to be concerned just to be open just to be frank, just to be helpful to one another, just to lift up one another, just to be an encouragement to one another. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. A little at a time, a good word, a good comment, a good name, a good advice, good interaction, good fellowship, not hiding anything from one another openness with one another honesty with one another that's what it takes caring for one another if we allow knowledge to guide us rather than feeling controlling us we'll have